everybody. Welcome to WCC TV. We hope you enjoy your time with us. Please like, subscribe and click on that little bell so that you'll always receive notifications whenever we are online. Hi, welcome to the third session of our Max on Life Bible Study. Today's challenging questions focus on relationships with God and our relationships with other believers. Scripture tells us that the most important thing we can do is to love God and love others. That's the greatest commandment. But relationships are hard. We can have dry seasons in our faith, and other people, they can just be downright obnoxious. Before Max guides us to Scripture to answer some of these difficult questions, let's listen to Ryan's story. Ryan is honest enough to share how distant he feels from God. I think we all go through seasons when we don't really feel God's presence. For me, growing up in a, in a Christian home, you know, praying before dinner and going to church on Sundays was mandatory. There was no way around it. I would daydream during church, wasn't really getting a whole lot out of it, just going through the motions. Whenever I left, uh, left for college, it was no surprise that, you know, the church thing kind of uh, took a backseat as well. I, I didn't go to church um, at all after I moved out. You know, I went away from college for a couple years, and then whenever I came back, all of a sudden that there was just like this small little hint, this little bitty fire burning inside me, just saying, "Hey, you need to, you know, go check church out again." I started going to church every Sunday. I was there. Um, there was a Bible study class that had just started up. I was there every single Sunday. I was praying regularly. I was uh, you know, serving in a couple different areas of the church. I was working with the youth. I was serving with the elderly. I was, just, I was just in a really, really good place. Everything was going just fine for me. And then all of a sudden, something just happened. I can't pinpoint the date, but um, that fire or that yearning to serve and to pray and to stay in the Word, uh, it just went away. I, uh, I no longer had that that fire inside of me saying, man, you need to be in the Word. You know, you need to be sharing the Word with other people. For me, it's harder to keep him number one when you have all these other things around you. Um, I have the job, you know, I have a house, I have a wife, I have a kid. And every day I thank him for the life that he's given me. But for some reason, that's the extent of my relationship with him right now. I wake up in the morning, God, thank you so much for this life that I get to live every single day, and that's it. There's no, no more prayer, there's no more Bible study, there's no more getting into the Word every single day. I'm still going to church on Sundays. You know, now it's more of the point to you know, keep my wife happy and to, uh, and to be a good example for my daughter. Uh, but that's, that's the reason that I'm going right now. I'm not getting a whole lot out of church whenever I go. You know, it has nothing to do with the lesson. It has nothing to do with the people that are preparing the lesson. It's me, you know, my heart's not right with God. Songs that used to make, you know, my eyes water, now they just bounce off of a hard heart. I don't know why I am where I am. Um, I certainly recognize where I'm at, and that's what scares me the most, is that I know where I should be. I know where I am right now, and I don't know how to get it. I don't know how to close the gap. You know, right now I'm just kind of at a stagnant place with my relationship or on my spiritual journey. So what do we do when we don't feel close to God? Well, there are times in all of our lives in which we just don't feel close to God. Our feelings are not always reliable barometers of our relationship with God. Sometimes we feel spiritual, sometimes we feel anything but, and the cause for this can be anything from being sick to passing through a tough time, to things that we've done or things people have done for us. But let's be careful and not put too much credit on these feelings. Uh, God's relationship with us does not depend upon our emotions toward Him. He's made a covenant toward us. And when we are enthused about our relationship with God, He loves it. When we're uh, dry in our walk with God, He doesn't disown us. Now, our, our feelings 
Our feelings in our relationship with God are similar to feelings in a marriage. You know, some days we feel really romantic and in love and excited. Of course, that's how my wife feels every day being married to me. But not everybody feels that way. I'm just kidding. Because sometimes in a relationship, the relationship gets a bit stale. But we stay in the relationship, don't we? At least I hope we do. We stay in the relationship. We don't bail out because we know that feelings can come and go. So what do we do? Well, I think the most basic solution to creating a deeper and more personal uh, emotional walk with God that changes our emotions is to spend time with Him. Uh, this morning I was reading in the Bible and I came across a verse that was very helpful just on this very topic. In Psalm 37, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. I like that phrase. Feed on His faithfulness. Chew on His faithfulness. Draw nutrition from His faithfulness. I had this image come to mind of cows out in a pasture and how they feed on the pasture and how that keeps them healthy. Listen, you, need, you and I both need to go into the pasture of God. Feed on His faithfulness on a regular basis. And this is done according to calendar management and then done according to just spontaneity throughout the day. It is important that you have a regular time with God. It's really important. Uh, for me, it works best to do this first thing in the morning. Your calendar might work differently. But determine a time that you meet with God every day. And don't let anybody else have that time. You put that on your calendar. And you find a place. I really recommend that you go to the same place every day so that the surrounding reminds you why you are there. And you bring with you an open heart. You bring with you an open Bible. And you and God just be together. The scripture says that the man who looks into the perfect mirror of God's law, the law of liberty, and makes a habit of doing so is not the man who sees and forgets. He puts that law into practice and he wins true happiness. Isn't that interesting? If we make a habit of looking into God's law, the result is true happiness. So make it a habit. Make it a part of your life. One of the most practical tools that I've ever used in my time with God is to, is to pray through Acts, the word Acts. I know this is very common. Maybe you've tried it. It's helpful to me, though, because my mind wanders when I pray. I like having some type of outline to guide me. So I think A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. I spend some moments adoring God, thinking about His faithfulness. I confess. I confess my need for Him. I confess my sins against Him. I give Him thanks. I thank God for all the blessings that He has given to me. It's amazing how a time of thanksgiving can lift us up out of a bad day. And supplication, I give to God all the concerns that I can think of and then I ask Him to receive the ones that I can't remember. I just give them all to Him. And it's amazing. We spend this time with God on a regular basis. The feelings will follow. Yes, God loves you and He wants you to love Him with all of your heart so you pursue Him and see what happens. How incredible is it that the almighty God of the universe wants to have a close relationship with you and with me? And the best way to grow closer in our relationship with God is to know Him more, to find Him in His Word, and to talk and listen to Him in prayer. But maybe your relationship with God is thriving. It's not God you have issues with, it's His people. Let's listen to Scott's story. While God is perfect, His people aren't. And like Scott, you may have been hurt by fellow Christians and wonder, how can Christians behave this way? I came on board to work for an international import company. But a part of that, it was related to religious-based values. And that was something that I internally knew that I wanted to work on. So it was a real win-win for me. Our values were really embedded in just our core of the company. Weekly, we would meet as a group. On Tuesday mornings, we'd meet with the, the partners of the company and 
Uh, we'd go through a Bible study in the morning, and then we'd also do that on our outside of work too. We'd, we'd uh, engage on a Thursday morning. We lived the Christian value, and we also worked with the Christian value. I, initially, it was just different. I had never been involved with an organization that put so much emphasis on faith and uh, being a part of that in business. I enjoyed it. I got involved. The work environment started to change as the economy was tightening. We started feeling the uh, retraction from the retailers in our industry. Our business went from really faith-based to, okay, what are we going to do to hang on? Uh, one afternoon, I was just brought into the office and told, uh, we got to let you go. Have your stuff packed like you were a criminal <laughs> and, and walked out the door. It's pretty demoralizing. I've never been in that situation before. It was hurtful. I, I would have expected as a business that was based on, on faith is that, you know, we would at least, you know, work, work with you until you could get yourself replanted into a new opportunity. That was, wasn't the case. It was pretty much ploy number three, you're gone. So I was leaving, I just thought, I, is this really happening to me? I, I, you know, I've always been very successful in my, in my careers and this is the first time I'm actually walking out of a, a business fired. I think where I was deeply hurt the most was in my mind there's a hundred other ways to handle a situation like that. Um, you know, especially being part of a Christian-based company. I mean, it made me weary of wanting to get involved with that type of value-based company again. You know, my, my brothers in Christ that I worked with turning their backs on me. I just was trying to do a job and work, work as hard as I could. I was struggling with the emotions of first time in my life having to go through that situation. And now I'm on the street. I've got a family that I have to take care of. I've got my, my two kids and a bit off more than I could chew on a house. Well, I'm not gonna be able to afford this anymore. Interestingly, once I was let go, nobody from the group reached out and nobody cared about the issues that I was going through. And I think for probably a couple of months, I was still trying to sort it out. Does God really have his hands in this? That I just needed to take a spiritual sabbatical. For me, it was all about understanding, I guess, you know, licking my wounds, <laughs> per se, and uh, needing to have time just to heal. Well, life in the church would sure be easier if it wasn't for people. Of course, the church wouldn't be church if it didn't have people. So we have to figure out ways to deal with the conflicts between people in a church. It seems to me that the church really resembles a family that's on a summer vacation. Initially, enthusiasm soars. Everybody is excited to go on the trip. We're singing songs in the car. Mom and dad and little Joe and little Susie are having a lot of fun. But 300 miles of interstate can take care of that. Before long, she's taking up too much of the back seat. Before long, he won't share the pillow. Dad refuses to ask for directions. Mom has to go to the restroom yet another time. Someone's feet smell, the tension swells. Each family member at some time during the trip is thinking, I'm getting out of this car. But we don't. We stay in the car. We stay on the trip, we stay on the journey, why? Well, for one thing, we can't reach the destination alone. We are family, we have to have each other. And we are family, we belong together. And so the question surfaces, can we not learn to accept one another? You see, this is God's plan. I, I have three siblings, uh, two older sisters and an older brother, and I am confident that there are times, have been times in which they thought about me and thought, I don't want him to be in the family. But guess what? They don't have a vote. I was born into the family. And when someone is born into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, he places them in the family and we don't get a vote. We learn to accept one another. It's not easy. But we can understand, can't we, why the Apostle Paul refers to the church as the body of Christ? We have to have the different parts in order for us to function. You know, when we go to work, if the stomach decides to stay home, it's gonna make for a long day. 
we go to school and the spleen says, well, I'm just not going to be a part of the class today, well, that leaves us without necessary parts of the body. We, we learn to work together. And if the different members of the body turn away every time there is a conflict, the result is a mess. Paul says that we are parts of Christ's body, that, that he is the head of the body, which is the church. You are not his body, I'm not his body, but together we are the body of Christ. And we have to trust that he has brought us together in the right way that God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as He pleased. Now, is there ever a time in which a person should leave a church? Yes, there is. In the event of immoral or dishonest leadership, if the pastors are using or abusing the flock, you get out. But otherwise, hang in there. Stay in there. Stay with the family. We need you. You need me. We need brains to help answer the questions, eyes to help see the problems, stomachs to digest the situation, spleens to process the bacteria, hands to hold us and feet to move us. We need each other. Don't eject yourself from the body now or it will die. I'm standing in the hall of the USS Constellation. This ship was a special ship because it was a freedom ship. It roamed the seas to identify slave ships that had taken slaves from Africa to recapture those slaves and to bring them back to their homeland. It was a ship of deliverance. Freedom matters. We are in a harbor where some of the battles were fought for freedom even in the United States of America. And Jesus Christ is about freedom. In fact, it is our Savior who said, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Freedom can be seen in the good news of the gospel. First of all, it's seen in the gospel's content which is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. But then freedom extends to the scope of the gospel. Jesus says in Luke 4, I've come to preach good news to the poor, the oppressed, to set the captives free. So God wants people to be free for heaven, but he also wants them to be delivered from illegitimate bondage on earth. The gospel's content takes care of eternity. The gospel's scope takes care of history. This ship reminds us that the gospel scope is designed to set the captives free. When I first started traveling, I would bring gifts home to my children. I would uh, come into the home and they would grab me and love on me. But after a while, they wanted to know when I was leaving again. Because after a while, they got so used to getting the gifts that it became more important than the giver. This is kind of the concept that Jesus is addressing in the second half of chapter six of the book of the Gospel of John. People who want the goodies from God who don't want God. Jesus has just fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, and the people have gone crazy about it. In fact, they want to make him now their king. But listen to what Jesus has to say. Jesus says to them in verse 26 of John 6, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. They didn't want a king. They wanted a burger king. <laughs> they wanted a king to feed them, to clothe them, to bless them. But what they didn't want was a savior to forgive them. There are a lot of theologies out here today that abound that has made God into a goody giver. It's made God into a cosmic Santa Claus. He's there for my blessing. 
not understanding that the reason God does what he does and the reason God gives what he gives is to draw attention to himself and to draw attention to his son. So this whole rest of chapter six is designed for Jesus to let the people know that the physical was only done to call them to the spiritual. Whenever the physical, bountiful goodness of God becomes an end in itself, it becomes idolatry. So Jesus uses this opportunity to teach the people about his real reason for coming. And it can be summed up in a phrase he used multiple times in this chapter. He says, I am the bread of life. In other words, I've come to satisfy you, but with life, spiritual life. And I gave you the physical food to draw your attention to my spiritual provision. So never be satisfied alone with what I can do for you externally and deny me my ultimate goal, which is to do something transformative for you internally and to give you eternal life. And so he says to them, don't grumble among yourselves. They were, they were in all kinds of confusion because I have come for he who believes in me will have eternal life. He offers that again throughout this chapter. Believe in me for eternal life. Come to me for eternal life. I am the bread of life. It's all about spiritual life and spiritual transformation. He says that your fathers fed you manna in the wilderness, but it was only manna given to you from God. See, their cry was, well, when we were in the wilderness, uh, our fathers uh, uh, gave us manna. And Jesus says, no, your fathers didn't give you manna. God gave you manna. In other words, it wasn't just what you got, it was where you got it from. They were so focused on what they receive from heaven. Manna is, uh, manna means what is it? That's what the Hebrew word manna means. And it was designed to produce an answer to the question. It is the supernatural provision of God. But they missed out on the who and just focused on the it and wind up complaining about it because they lost sight of who. Every time you see the goodness of God, it ought to draw your attention to the God who is good. And every time you see the God who is good, it ought to remind you, he has given you his goodness to give you him. And so to reject Jesus Christ is to reject the real food. And that's why he uses this phrase. This is the bread, verse 50 says, which has come down from heaven so that you may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also, which I will give him for the life of the world is in my flesh. In other words, my person, I have come to give you life. I have come so that you don't have to die. I have come for the forgiveness of your sins. So if you're gonna eat something that really matters, eat me. He's talking about appropriating his offer of salvation. And when you appropriate his offer of salvation, he grants you the forgiveness of sins and he gives you the never ending, eternally secure gift of eternal life. He then comes later on in the chapter to define himself even further because many were stumbling over what he was saying. They didn't understand the spiritual principle behind the physical miracle he had just done. He says, what then if you see the son of man ascending to where he was before? In other words, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. But there are some of you who do not believe. They would not accept it even though they had just seen the miracle. Why? Because like us, they wanted the blessing without the blesser. Peter then comes on the scene, and I love Peter because Peter spoke what he felt. He wanted to know, Jesus said to his disciples, you do not want to go away also, do you? Because many had left Jesus when he had spoke these very difficult words to them about 
their emphasis on the physical over the spiritual. But Simon Peter says, Lord, verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. This is Peter's classic statement of affirmation that Jesus came to offer eternal life to all who would receive it. Jesus had to make one correction, however. He said to them that there was one of them who was a devil in verse 70, and he was referring to Judas who would betray him. So the principle of this portion of John is that God wants to feed you. He doesn't mind feeding you physically as long as you don't stop there. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above. While you're enjoying the gift, don't forget the above. First of all, by receiving Jesus Christ as your personal savior for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of eternal life. But then after you've received him, don't forsake him. It says many left him because when the goodies were no longer coming, they didn't see their need for him anymore. Everything you need in the life to come is provided for by Christ, but everything you need for this life comes from the good hand of a gracious God. That's why the Bible teaches us to receive what we get from God with a heart of thanksgiving. Don't forget the giver while you enjoy the gift. That's the lesson of this chapter, starting with your spiritual salvation, but starting with spiritual gratitude, spiritual service, spiritual appreciation for everything else that God brings to your way in your life. Appropriate Christ. He says, if you drink my blood and you eat of my flesh, that is, you appropriate my life in you. Every time you have communion, every time you sit at the Lord's table, it should be a reminder. That's why we call communion the Eucharist. It is the spiritual presence of Christ reminding you that the good things in this life and in the life to come all come because of him and the work that he did in providing a substitutionary sacrifice for your sins and minds so we can have eternal life. Sometimes, in order to follow where God is leading us, we have to wear spiritual blinders. I talk about that in the chapter on Joshua. Horses wear blinders so that they won't get distracted by what's around them, especially at the races. And we have to imagine that we're wearing spiritual blinders sometimes when God is leading us on a scary path. And the idea of spiritual blinders is also true when it comes to temptation. Because if we don't wear spiritual blinders, sometimes we get distracted by some of the things around us. And temptation isn't just one big decision. It's a thousand little decisions that we make that lead up to that big decision. That was true in the story of David and Bathsheba. David is somewhere he's not supposed to be. It was the time when kings go off to war. And David was home. He sent Joab out with the king's army. And so often when it comes to temptation, we are where we're not supposed to be. And that's where David was. And then the second part of the passage that shows that he was where he wasn't supposed to be is that it was evening. This was a time when typically in that culture, many people would bathe to prepare for the evening meal. And they did that on their roofs. This was not unusual because they would collect the rainwater and then they would bathe on their roofs. Now, what I found out when I was in Jerusalem, actually, I went on a study tour many, many years ago when I was at Fuller Seminary. And we, I remember the day that we went and we sort of looked at where, uh, where David's palace was through excavations. They've been able to, to, to show where it was. And Jerusalem is a city on a hill, and the king's palace was always built at the top so that he could walk out and look down on his kingdom. 
And so when we were there that day, we imagined the story. Of course, David, when he came out on his roof, he could see all the roofs of everybody beneath him. And so when you think about that, it's evening. It's a time when people are bathing, and David goes outside. Now, I preface this story that way because I think so often we have either seen a movie or we have this idea that Bathsheba was kind of doing a flash dance number on her roof. Now, some of you are a little too young to even know what flash dance is, but go back to the 80s. It was a movie where Jennifer Beals does this sort of, you know, the water comes down. She's, it's a very sensual. And we imagine that Bathsheba is doing something like that. But the truth is, Scripture is silent about that. We don't know how modest or immodest she was being, but we do know that her husband was part of the king's army and he was away. So it's very likely that she assumed that David was away as well because David was the king and he was supposed to be with his army. So whatever is going on in Uriah's mind, it's doubtful that she's thinking that she is being watched as she bathes in the evening. And from his highest roof, David walks outside and sees her. Now I just want to stop right there in the story. There isn't a person in this auditorium who hasn't been where David was at that moment. And what we're going to see in this story is there are so many choices that we can make when we're heading down the road to temptation. And we just watch David as he walks right into it. So he's out on his roof. He sees this beautiful woman. And then he sends someone to find out about her. He finds out. And by question, you know, I love the way the servant said, well, isn't this Bathsheba, like the wife of one of your soldiers? And you don't even hear, David does not even respond to that. But you will notice in the next three verses, things move fast. And don't they always move fast when we're being tempted? See, we, we don't want to think during those times. It's kind of like, la, 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 la. You know, we just, we're, we're headed. We're, we're going. We know where we're going, right? And that's exactly the language of the passage. I mean, you can just see he sent for her. She came to him. And then he slept with her. And then the only time we hear from Bathsheba is a message that comes back to the palace. And you notice that it doesn't even say Bathsheba. Her name isn't even used. This was an act of lust on David's part. The woman sent word back to the palace saying to David, I am pregnant. Okay, so here we have David caught. He's in the midst of his sin, and he has a choice to come clean at that moment. He could confess. But no, David does what so many of us do when we're caught, and that is we immediately think of what we can do to hide, to hide what we've done. There are hundreds of little decisions we make that set us up for success or failure spiritually. And the community that we surround ourselves with can help us make better earlier decisions before the later decisions that are usually a little too late. One of the things that we can do is to find a mentor to speak into our life. David had a mentor, it was Nathan, but he came in a little too late in the story. If only David had sought his advice before that night with Bathsheba. And we saw an example of mentorship with Samuel and Eli, where Eli helped Samuel hear God's voice. And that's what a mentor can do. They help you learn how to discern and hear God's voice in your life. But it's not just about having a mentor. It's actually also about being a mentor because we're part of a huge community of faith. And both of these things will help you grow spiritually. My mentor right now is 81 years old. She lives in Lafayette. I still call her all the time. She is literally going to have the house next to Jesus when I get to heaven. I know it. I mean, she's amazing. And she has spoken into my life. I have just picked up mentors everywhere. You do the same. But it doesn't stop there. you got to pass it on. 
And so I am now involved. I just birthed this new conference. It's called She Grows, and it's an intergenerational women's conference for the purpose of promoting intergenerational relationships. We are part of a chain of faith. You have people ahead of you, and they're passing the baton back. And then you grab the baton, and then you pass it on. This thing is big that we've got. This faith is big. And this is God's master plan. It's person to person to person to person. So pass it on. So in this quest of spiritual growth, don't just have voices that speak into your life. Be that voice for someone else. Because both of those things are going to help you grow spiritually. So now take some time and talk about some of the things that have helped you grow in your faith and helped you follow the path that God has for you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I think that phrase right there, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake, is at the epicenter of Psalm 23. It's the gravitational pull of the passage. It helps us understand why he would be our good shepherd to begin with. It helps us understand why he's bringing peace and why he's bringing provision and why there's such care for us, why there's such devotion and love for us. And then moving on in the study, it's gonna help frame for us why it is that there's this celebration around us how he comforts us through difficult seasons and ultimately how goodness and mercy is going to follow us and why we can be so confident that these things are true. See, if the people of God ever needed to be led in anything, it was to be led into paths of righteousness. Throughout our history, both yours and mine and biblical history and Christian history, the people of God can't seem to stay on the path of righteousness for very long. We, we see this in the giving of the law. We see this after God does miraculous things. It doesn't take God's people long to forget about God and do their own thing, to step away from God as he's revealed himself according to the plans that he's laid before us and choose our own path, our own way. We always seem to stumble off the path of righteousness. It's like the path of righteousness is hugging this cliff and we just can't seem to stay on it without falling off that cliff. And so the good news of Psalm 23, especially in light of John 10 and Jesus being the good shepherd, is that we're going to finally be led to the path of righteousness in a way that doesn't just have to do with our kind of external moral righteousness because God is about more than that. He wants more for us than that. See, the path of righteousness is not about white knuckled discipline. His plan for our lives isn't begrudging submission. It's not that I, I better do this with great discipline before God destroys me. No, he, he wants freedom from the inside out. See, he's not after just moral transformation. He's after a transformation of heart rooted in joy, in salvation, that ultimately then affects our behavior from the inside out, not the outside in. I just have to believe many of us are enslaved to an idea of religion that is far different than Christianity, where the God of the Bible is interested in giving us a new heart, giving us a new spirit, giving us new desires, and this is where Jesus, the good shepherd, is leading us. Now, how he does that is pretty spectacular. In three places in John 10, Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. This laying down of Jesus' perfect, righteous 
life on the cross is about getting you and I to righteousness, getting the people of God on that path and on that path in a way that we can never be knocked off that path. See, Jesus on the cross is absorbing all of God's wrath towards our sins, all of our sins, past, present, and future, fully, freely, and forever. And then he imputes that righteousness to us so that we're seen as holy, spotless, blameless in the sight of God. So when we surrender our life to Christ, when we say yes, and we become believers, we have been given the righteousness of Christ. We've been placed on the path of righteousness and we can never be moved off that path. We've been given new hearts, sealed with the Holy Spirit, and over time, progressive sanctification will transform our external moral righteousness. But we've been righteous internally before God all along. Now, I think it's key, if we're really gonna get this and be set free by this idea, we've gotta understand that phrase at the end of it. He leads me in paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. See, I, I think that idea, the, the idea that it's about God's goodness, not about my goodness, about God's glory, not about my glory, about God's power, not about my power, is key to joyful Christian living and transformation. It's key to glorification, it's key to sanctification. See, if I think it's about my goodness, then man, when I'm stumbling, when I struggle, when I fall off the external moral righteous path, then I think, man, surely uh, I'm off forever. And, and yet, because it's about God's goodness, it's about God's strength, about God's power, not about my strength, not about my power. In my weakness, God is still strong. In my frailty, he is still powerful. In my lack of faith, he is still faithful. This, for the sake of my name, becomes the anchor. Like I said, becomes the gravitational pull that lets me believe, although I am a weak and frail man who's prone to certain compulsions, the good high priest, the good shepherd, is still leading me beside still waters, not because I deserve it, but because he's good. And, and he leads me into green pastures in a desert wasteland, not because I'm worthy, but because he's generous. Now this lifts my eyes on his glory and might and off of my frailty in a way that produces joy. And that joy becomes the fuel of obedience. And that obedience starts to transform my external, moral, righteous purview. And so I want to encourage you this way. God's commitment to you, his love for you, his desire to bless you, his willingness to give you the things that we're reading about and the things that we're going to look at as we progress, it's not all built around you. It's built around his godness, his glory, his namesake. In fact, that's one of the great themes of the Bible for the sake of my name. So be encouraged tonight. Again, no matter where you find yourself tonight, God's godness is bigger than any weakness, any struggle, any doubt, any fear, any weariness. His godness overcomes it all. You have been placed on the path of righteousness by the Spirit of God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you're not there, the invitation is there to join the household of faith, the flock of the God of the Bible. We live on an amazing planet. I mean, it's insane when you think about just our existence and the way that we think and the way that we live. I'm, and, and when you look at creation and you, and you see these trees and it's just, just all of God's creation, it's hard to imagine, right, that all of this was an accident? Like, it was just a coincidence? that there was nothing or little particles that, that suddenly formed all of this. 
But the moment your mind starts to go, you know what, there has to be a creator. The moment you start to go there, you go, then, but if he's so good and so powerful, why is there so much pain and suffering in this world? I mean, why, why right now am I standing at my mother's grave? If God is so good, why did she die while she was giving birth to me? It doesn't make sense. I mean, if he's all powerful, he could have stopped that. Why did the God who, who, who created the laughter create tears? Or the God who created life create death? And, and, and why, why if, if he's so good, after my, my dad remarried, why is it that when I finally had a mom again, that my stepmom dies in a car accident. I was only eight years old. And then, and then why, if, if we've got this holy, wonderful God, if he's so wonderful, why did my dad die of cancer when I was 12 years old? Explain that. I mean, I'm in middle school. I don't have parents anymore. And, and some of you have gone through things even more painful than that. And, and if God is so good, these are the thoughts that run through our mind because something doesn't seem right. We see all the beauty, we see all the majesty, but then we see the pain and go, man, this doesn't seem right. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches too. It says, look, this isn't the way it was meant to be. Something did go wrong. See, in Genesis 1, after God created the world and created Adam and Eve, he told them, look, everything here on this earth, it's for you, okay? You, you rule over it, you take care of it, you enjoy it. He goes, but there's one tree and I don't want you to eat of that one tree. He goes, in fact, if you eat of that tree, everything's gonna change. The moment God gave them that command, he was also giving them a choice, a choice between good and evil, a choice to obey or a choice to rebel. Had they obeyed, everything was going to be good. But because they rebelled, God warned them. He says, look, if you eat of that tree, you will die. Death will enter the world. And so when they were tempted and they ate of that, God had to come true with what he promised. He says, look, I told you this was the warning. And right then everything changed and suddenly death entered the world and there was a curse upon this earth. So when you and I look at things on this earth and go, something seems wrong, something seems off, we're absolutely right. This wasn't what he wanted. It wasn't what he intended. But what the Bible says is that one day things are gonna change and he's gonna redeem the world and there's gonna be a, a new heaven and a new earth and everything's going to be different. But until then, we're here and we face pain. But the crazy thing about it is the Bible says that God can even use the pain that we're suffering right now for His glory. He can turn it into a good thing. That's why in James chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. He says, look, even if you're going through difficult times, you can find joy in that. In fact, you can count it all joy because he says what God does is, is not just redeem the whole world, but he even redeems this pain in our lives. He says he can actually use it to make us stronger. It's the very thing that brings steadfastness or perseverance into us. And he says if you let it have its perfect result, then you yourself become mature and complete. That's why some of the elderly people that you know that have so much character and just seem so far beyond us, man, look into their lives. It's because they went through some pain and they made it through. And God says, that's the way I use pain. I can actually use it for your benefit to make you a strong person, mature, complete, lacking in nothing. Because it's during those difficult times that we would actually draw close to Him. Think of it like this, it's like when you're, when you're making a cake 
it, you know, you use ingredients like flour and butter and eggs and sugar. And, and, and if you look at each ingredient, like the, the butter, you ever, you ever just take like a half a cube of butter and throw it in your mouth and suck on it? I mean, it's, it's gross. Or you, you take a handful of flour and throw it in your mouth terrible or you crack an egg it's horrible and you know you know the sugar's fine but you mix it all up and you throw it in an oven and out comes this mature complete you're, you're concerned about the end result and, and that's what God's saying is there are ingredients he throws in our lives but what we don't understand is man those things mixed in he's concerned about who we are at the end of our lives he says, you can use this process to redeem you. It will make you mature and complete. In fact, the Bible says later on in verse 12, it says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. He says, the person who makes it through, and doesn't just freak out and curse God and just ditch him. The person who actually perseveres through the trial, because there's something that trial does in us to strengthen us. It's easy to, it's easy to love God when he just gives you everything you want. But what if you go through some difficult times? Do you actually cling to him for that? Do you cling to him during those times? Do you draw near in faith to him? Because he says the person who receives the crown of life is the person who loves him. And the person who loves him is the one who endures the trial. You see, trials can actually be a good thing. I can look back at my life now and say, God, I'm actually grateful that my parents died at a young age because it caused me to think differently about life. From the time I was in middle school on, I started to ask myself questions like, what is this all about? I don't take any day for granted. I don't take for granted that I have tomorrow, that by the time you're watching this, that I'm still gonna be on the earth. I don't know that, and so I make the most of every day. When I put my kids to bed at night, man, I don't, I don't just assume, oh, I'll see them tomorrow. All these are good things. It caused me to cherish life, but it also caused me to pursue God. I mean, when I'm 12 and, and I don't have parents, I'm thinking, okay, what's this life all about? This can end at any second. Like, this could be my last day on earth. I better figure out what's after that. Man, and it was during that time that I began to question, what is this all about? Is there something bigger than me? Is he for real? Can I know him? What's it gonna be like when this life is all over? See, it was the deaths of my parents that caused me to think of these things and caused me to eventually find God and know him like I do. And anything that would cause me to find God is a huge blessing, no matter how painful it was at the time. I've met many people who've come to God, come to know Him through the most painful times of their lives because they saw, okay, this can't be coincidence, but I don't understand this pain, but it's as they tried to figure it out, they found God. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today on WCC TV. We hope to see you again next week at 5 p.m. for our next episode. God bless you and keep you safe.